Uh, good morning again. I'm uh, Jatin Shah from New York, and I've been assigned the responsibility of moderating the next panel on uh, low-risk papillary carcinoma. Uh, we have transitioned nicely from this morning from evaluation of a thyroid nodule to its molecular characteristics, and the logically the next problem would be management of the most common and almost epidemic proportion problem of Loris papillary carcinoma. Can I have my first slide, please? Uh, next. So in order to address this panel, we have a distinguished group of specialists from the United States. Uh, Dr. Louise Davies, uh, an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, uh, who has a serious and uh, committed interest in the rising incidence of thyroid cancer. And ha she has extensively worked and published from the SEER database uh, on uh, the personalized prognostic estimates on patients with uh, newly diagnosed thyroid cancer. Uh, we then have Professor Kwang Du, uh, who, who is chief of the section of endocrine surgery at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, he's an expert endocrine surgeon uh, with expertise in thyroid and parathyroid surgery, as well as other endocrine glands. We then have a gentleman who grew up at high altitude throughout his life uh, from Denver, uh, Professor Brian Hogan, uh, whose serious interest is in molecular mechanisms of thyroid carcinogenesis and the pathophysiology and molecular therapeutic targets in thyroid cancer. And finally, we have Dr. Doug Ross from here in Boston. He's professor of medicine at Harvard and co-director of the thyroid clinic at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he has numerous uh, accolades, including being a section editor and on the editorial board of thyroid and a uh, uh, a member of the National Thyroid Cancer Treatment Cooperative Group. So we have assigned each of these speakers to specifically address certain issues in low-risk papillary carcinomas, and then we'll have a, a series of cases to uh, have them address the uh, pinpoint problems pert uh, pertaining to those cases, which baffle us as clinicians in day-to-day -day practice. What do I do? if I run into a problem like this. So I'll try to uh, find out cases which will befit that, that particular uh, issue. Our first speaker is Dr. Davis, and we have asked her to define what is low-risk thyroid cancer. She's going to also share with us the incidence of low-risk cancers in the United States and the world, and define also the high-risk populations. Louise? Good morning. Thanks for including me in this very distinguished panel. Let's see if this will work. There we go. So my job in the next 10 minutes or so is to just set the stage about what low-risk cancers actually are. And I'm also going to try to put some of the recent developments around the incidence and mortality data in some context for us. Let's start with the definition, because it does have some nuance to it, right? So subtype of your cancer matters. Classic type of papillary cancer is clearly low risk, as is actually minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer. The follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer, as you know, has been proposed by Dr. Nikiforov and colleagues to be relabeled as a non-cancer by the World Health Organization. We're hoping that'll happen soon, but of course, Tall cell, columnar, and insular cell subgroups are not considered low-risk cancers. You can actually have your cancer in some nearby lymph nodes and still be called low-risk. Fewer than five, and they got to have two millimeters or less of tumor in them. So I call it the five and two rule. And the tumor can't be hiding out in the fat around the thyroid gland. And particularly for the follicular cancers, it can't be in more than four uh, vessels on the path report. Now, after you've done your surgery, if you feel comfortable there was complete structural clearance, that puts you firmly well into that category. And then, of course, the truly low-risk tumors 
are the ones that are going to behave well as we do dynamic restratification over time. But I think before we even move on, let me just take a minute and remind us who is actually at risk of developing thyroid cancer compared to the rest of the population. And this is what we know and um, kind of on the more for sure side. So if you're exposed to significant radiation doses before age 20, your thyroid is quite sensitive then. And I've been watching the epidemiologic data pretty carefully about what's happening around volcanic areas, and it does seem like there is both the mechanism and the epidemiologic data to suggest that people exposed to volcanic and heavy metals are at increased risk as well. So in this super useful table, which I have pasted to the back of the door in my office, <laughs> the uh, most recent ATA guidelines tell you what the risk of structural disease recurrence is once you've done surgery and you have your PATH report in hand. So you can actually place people on this spectrum of risk based on the available evidence. And of course, we're focusing here this afternoon or this morning on the discussion for the bottom part of the spectrum where the low risk tumors live. So let's blow this up so we can get a closer look on the next slide. So using this spectrum approach, you can see where on the ladder your patient falls with the very low risk those people with just a 1% to 2% risk of recurrence below this red line, this very tiny red line I made, and those above still having a pretty low risk of recurrence in the 4 to 6% range. Notice we're talking here about recurrence risk, not risk of death, right? So let's recall the outcomes in terms of number of deaths for papillary thyroid cancer is excellent, right? So in this Kaplan-Meier curve, the years since diagnosis are along the bottom, going all the way out to 30 years. And the proportion of people who have not died of their cancer is there along the vertical axis. And of course, the most deadly by far is anaplastic, 7% survival at five years. Papillary thyroid cancer is in the very high 90s, even following people out to 20 to 30 years. So what we really have to be thinking about here is recurrence and the risk to quality of life after the initial treatment and of the revision surgeries and other interventions if there is a recurrence. Now, it's important to remember that not everybody has the luxury of receiving their care from a surgeon who does exclusively or nearly exclusively thyroid surgery, and we know uh, that actually most people do not receive their care in that way. So the complication rates are not zero. I'm not going to go into all the other things. I'll just stick with the surgical stuff that I know. <laughs> so let's move on to what is likely a very familiar graph now, because this is what's going to be at the cocktail party chatter um, and what your patients are going to be asking you if they're reading the literature. So this is probably very familiar to you by now. Over the past 30 years, the incidence of thyroid cancer has more than tripled. There is now broad agreement that the increase has been largely due to the detection of subclinical disease, i.e. low-risk disease, and this is because mortality had not been observed to change substantially. We know there's a subclinical reservoir. People die with the disease, never having been uh, demonstrated to have it while they were alive. We know if you have more access to care and you live in a fee-for-service system, you're at higher risk of developing a thyroid cancer. We know if you look more carefully at your path specimens, you'll find more cancer. But then this spring, a very careful, well-done analysis led by Hyeyeon Lim and colleagues came out, and they found that in looking at the mortality trends between 1994 and 2013, among the people presenting with distant disease at the time of presentation, there was a statistically significant change upward in the mortality rate. And this suggested to them that there is also a true increase in thyroid cancer occurring because we were observing an increased mortality rate. And I think this is a really important thing for us to talk about because it gets confusing quickly because it brings up the question, if mortality is increasing, and by extension, therefore, some of the increasing incidence is real, not an artifact of what we'll be able to see, does this mean that the concept of low-risk thyroid cancer needs to be revisited or even should go away? I think the answer is no. Low-risk thyroid cancer is not going away, and I pre feel pretty sure that Dr. Lim and colleagues weren't trying to say that. Their assertion that there might be a true increase in thyroid cancer 
does not mean that they think every thyroid cancer now needs to be re-examined with a newly distrustful eye about its behavior. But I think before we start worrying that this new higher mortality type thyroid cancer is out there, we have to look at other cancers to learn from their trends. Specifically, I'm going to talk here about prostate cancer. Sorry. <laughs> but you're probably getting a little bored of the thyroid cancer thing anyway, right? So here's a picture of the incidence and mortality trends for prostate cancer. And prostate cancer has been dealing with overdiagnosis about 20 years longer than we have in thyroid cancer. Also, because it's about 10 times more common than thyroid cancer, it's a whole lot easier to trace the incidence and mortality trends. So you'll notice here that in the 80s and 90s, screening for prostate cancer was quite common, and they had dramatically increasing incidence. And interestingly, mortality also went up. Then, as screening fell out of favor, the incidence rate fell, and the mortality rate fell also. So mortality rates can be deceiving in the setting of overdiagnosis. And while I think there were many forces at work in the prostate cancer story, a possible reason that I just want to focus on today to start getting us talking about and understanding is the concept of attribution bias. So attribution bias uh, is, is known to be a problem in all epidemiologic data sets. And it's the incorrect assignment of the cause of death, attributing it to a cancer in a person's medical history, rather than correctly to the other causes that actually resulted in the person's death. They die at a nursing home, the person who fills out the death certificate isn't really sure exactly what happened, and they write as the underlying cause of death this diagnosis of um, cancer that they had in their history. Now, as the incidence of a cancer increases by detection, percent, uh, perhaps, of um, disease that was relatively quiet, the pool of prevalent cases increases. So even a small, stable rate of, attri uh, of attribution bias is going to lead to an increase in the total number of deaths attributed to that cancer. So if we start to see the incidence of thyroid cancer fall, as we've begun to observe, we might actually see the mortality rate go down slightly also, just because of the attribution bias that's known to occur in any data set, no matter how good of a job we do with it. Now, I'm not saying that this doesn't mean that there can't also be a true increase in thyroid cancer, because I do think those data are, um, are out there and are something we need to pay attention to and uh, is, a, is a part of the story, right? So when you think back to the paper that Amy Chen published in 2009, pointing out that the incidence of large cancers was increasing, there was also counterfactual to that, but the trend there has increased, and the rates of the largest cancers have actually tripled, even though they're still rare. And as you can see in this update, you, the trend line continues to go up, but what I really want you to take home from this picture is that the larger problem is still the detection of these small tumors, the low-risk tumors, the ones that we're talking about here on this panel today. And this problem, of course, is not uh, confined just to the U.S. Uh, this is a great paper from uh, Vaccarella et al. They are at the International Agency for Research on Cancer in France. They published it in 2016. And they estimated the degree of increased incidence of thyroid cancer that was due to the detection of asymptomatic non-lethal disease, which are largely the kind of cancers that we're talking about here today on this panel. So this is sort of complicated graph. I actually, it takes me a while to look at this. I'm going to assume that at least one other person in this room would benefit from hearing me describe it more carefully. So what they did is they compared the historical rates, the pre-ultrasound and needle biopsy by age group to the observed rates from 1988 to 2007. And they did simply a subtraction between what you would have calculated the rates are by age group compared to what they were actually observing. So on the vertical axis, this is the picture for women, um, you can see that there's the incidence per 100,000 women is on the vertical axis and on the horizontal is the categories of age group. So Italy's up here on the left, France is below it, and of course South Korea, which you could tell probably without me telling you, is on the right because the incidence is just crazy high. And the darkest shaded areas show the incidence by age group from 2003 to 7. 
And the periods 98 to 02 and 93 to 97 are the light, lighter shaded areas below it. So they're showing you how much the incidence has increased over time. This darkest dotted line is what you would have expected it to be had people not been detecting um, what they hypothesized is the low risk asymptomatic disease. So the excess incidence is what you're seeing between that dotted line and the top of the shaded stuff. So it's big. The other um, countries for which they made calculations um, show significantly less. So it's definitely still happening in places like England and Scotland. Japan has been affected somewhat. Uh, and the Nordic countries, Australia, uh, has had much more of an issue with this. Now, as we consider these problems as a field globally, and we work to develop best practices for the management of this low-risk disease, uh, as might be expected, we're seeing it not just in the grown-ups, <laughs> I like to call it, but unfortunately also in the kids. And this just came out last month. Um, the rates among people ages 0 to 29 are increasing dramatically. I think this deserves a lot of our attention. These are the people with the longest amount of life uh, ahead of them, and thus for whom it's even much more important that we get things right. Um, quality of care issues were noted to be prominent in this group um, of, from the Ontario Registry. More than half received radioactive iodine. There are new pediatric ATA guidelines, so we're hoping this will have an impact, but I think this should be certainly a call to awareness and a call to arms for us. So I'm going to turn it over now to my colleagues who will take it off and then we'll have cases at the end. Thank you, Luis. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Brian Hogan and he is going to share with us the diagnostic workup, the added value of genomic testing, cost effectiveness of genomic testing, and the current ATA guidelines for workup of low-risk thyroid carcinoma. Brian. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. With that introduction, I'll spend the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes talking about workup. No, <laughs> it won't be nearly that long. This will, this will be brief so we can get to the cases. But I really want to talk about a lot of the, the preoperative. Once you have somebody who has a fine needle aspiration biopsy positive, what workup do we do before surgery? What things should we consider? It's my disclosure. Um, so one of the first things we think about is the ultrasound. And a lot of times now, the, a full neck ultrasound is being done even for the evaluation of a nodule. But if it hasn't been done and you have a nodule that is either suspicious or diagnostic for thyroid cancer, we need to do a full neck ultrasound. And one of the reasons is to look at the tumor itself. And this just shows an example of a nice low-risk tumor that's well within the thyroid versus a higher-risk tumor that possibly is invading anteriorly. And that can really help us distinguish preoperatively what may be a lower-risk tumor versus a high-risk tumor that can help guide uh, the surgical approach. And of course, the other big reason we do ultrasound is to look at lymph nodes. And on the top, we have an example of a normal lymph node with a normal shape, echogenic hilum. And that has a very good sensitivity for saying this is benign. On the other hand, if you have uh, bright internal echoes that could be microcalcifications, that has a good specificity for likely being malignant, or if you have a cystic nodule, a cystic lymph node. And obviously, you need to map that out in the neck to decide what's the best approach for surgery. So the guidelines, the uh, 2015 guidelines say that a preoperative neck ultrasound for cervical lymph nodes is recommended for all patients. Strong recommendation based on moderate quality evidence. And also if you do find abnormal lymph nodes, and we say in there, if you're going to use the information and do something about it, a fine needle aspiration biopsy should be done. The other point brought up is the addition of a thyroglobulin washout could be considered in select patients, but interpretation may be difficult in patients with an intact thyroid gland. And there is some literature out there, and I think one thing that needs to be done is a serum thyroglobulin when you do that in a patient with an intact thyroid gland to help interpret the thyroglobulin wash in that lymph node. What about other imaging that we think about in patients like this? And one, again, in the guidelines, one of the things is discussing cross-sectional imaging, such as CT or MR. And this should really be reserved for those patients who are at a higher clinical suspicion for advanced disease. 
And again, this is a strong recommendation based on low quality evidence, but in our typical patient who clinically and from ultrasound seems to be a low risk patient, we don't need to do a bunch of other imaging. And also that same recommendation says PET should not be routinely used and definitely not in our low risk patients. This is reserved for our higher risk patients who we aren't talking about today. What about a preoperative serum thyroglobulin? And again, what I'll show you is, is this is what the guidelines say, routine preoperative measurement of serum thyroglobulin and antibodies is not recommended. Weak recommendation, low quality evidence. Why was this? If you look at the text, it's not a good preoperative prognostic marker for that patient, and there hasn't been evidence that uh, changes uh, management, or there is really not good evidence that changing, uh, it does change management. One thing I will say about this, having been a person who's been very involved in the guidelines, is this is a moment of true confessions. Um, I actually measure it, even when we say don't measure it. Um, and so I, I think what we do with these patients, it, where it can be helpful is you're assessing the antibody status, and especially if you're considering lobectomy versus thyroidectomy, if the antibody status may play a role, that's helpful. The other thing I think that can be helpful, if you do have positive antibodies and you do have a measurable thyroglobulin, they may not be interfering. This would be called what I call an auto-recovery assay. So it's something to be considered, um, and also a low preoperative thyroglobulin may be predictive that the tumor itself, thyroglobulin may not be a good post-operative marker. So I think there's information to be gained here. I think we need more studies, but this is an area where Sorry, I'm not following the guidelines. Uh, what about molecular markers? I was asked to just talk a little bit about molecular markers. And uh, of course, the, really the first one that we talked a lot about was the BRAF V600E. And this is really a nice paper by many authors led by Ming Xiaoxing um, looking at survival in patients with BRAF mutations. And I'll just show you one of their figures. In the blue is a BRAF negative of all the cancers that they looked at. And in the black is BRAF positive. And you can see that overall that survival is lower if you have BRAF positivity. As we know, in papillary thyroid cancer, anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of patients are going to have a BRAF mutation. And we know that that doesn't directly affect survival. I think BRAF is quite a good predictor of what you may find at surgery as far as invasion, excessive lymph nodes. But beyond that, I don't know if it's a really helpful prognostic marker. So we're not necessarily using that routinely um, in our patients. To me, what's a bit more exciting is using the um, telomerase gene and this uh, TERT promoter mutation that you heard Jim Fagan talk about and others talk about. Um, this really has a big prognostic indicator. And as you can see, the top dark line is neither a TERT or BRAF mutation. The next line, just barely below it, is the BRAF mutation, a little bit of a prognostics for survival. TERT itself, just a TERT mutation, really seems to affect a survival, and the combination greatly affects survival. And this is something, again, that I think we need more information, but this is, to me, the TERT could be a better prognostic indicator uh, than BRAF. One problem is, is in our seemingly low-risk patients, TERT promoter mutations are going to be very rare. So that's another reason why we maybe wouldn't just commonly use it in all our low-risk patients. And so I come back to the same thing that Louise showed, and what I want to point out in red is where we do mention mutations. And this was a discussion in the guidelines group. We first led with the mutation and then discussed it. We actually put it on the back end, and with an asterisk, basically saying that measurement is not, at least at the time of publishing the guidelines, routinely recommended, and especially, I would say, for a clinically and sonographically seeming low-risk tumor that we're considering next steps. The mutation status, at least looking at BRAF and TERT, is not something that we necessarily want to do, although you can see there is some, uh, as far as recurrence now, not survival, there is some differences when you have mutations. And a TERT mutation has actually, even in any PTC over one centimeter, um, has a high uh, recurrence rate of approximately 40 percent. So this is something I think that we could be using in the future. And then the last diagnostic procedure I would suggest, and then we'll lead on to uh, our next colleague, but is uh, a diagnostic procedure of localizing a good surgeon. Um, and so this is uh, a study that basically looked at lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy, and then the volume of the surgeon. In dark blue is a low volume surgeon, less than 10 per year. The intermediate in yellow is 10 to 99, 
and then greater than 99 is in that light green. And you can see lobectomy versus thyroidectomy. And two things come out. One is the more extensive procedure, the uh, higher the uh, risk of um, a side effect, even in the hands of a high volume surgeon. High volume surgeons tend to do better than low volume surgeons for hypocalcemia and for vocal cord paralysis. But this is the idea then of coming to talking about in these low risk tumors, do we think about a lobectomy or do we think about a thyroidectomy? So just to summarize, I think we need to do a careful full neck ultrasound in these patients who we think have low risk tumors. Biopsy suspicious or indeterminate lymph nodes if it's going to help change the management in that patient. Other imaging is generally not necessary for these patients. It says in the guidelines you don't have to measure or you shouldn't measure a preoperative thyroglobulin. Like I said, true confessions, this is what I'm doing now. Molecular markers are not yet ready for prime time, but I'll tell you there are many academic groups and some companies who are working very hard on prognostic, looking at prognostic uh, markers. And then the last thing I would say is, next thing is find a good surgeon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. I, I like your last recommendation for the workup to find a good surgeon. And we have one on the panel, Dr. Kwan Du, uh, and we have asked him to speak on treatment of low risk cancers, operate or observe, extent of surgery, and the added value of elective node dissection. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Luis, in the attribution uh, part of it, you wonder whether the surgeons are killing the patient. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so I, I, I do worry about that part of it, and, uh, and, uh, and thank you, Brian, about looking for good surgeons. But, um, so uh, my, my job is uh, basically as a surgeon looking at uh, the, these low-risk thyroid cancers, and I'm going to concentrate some of it on the uh, more recent uh, findings about especially micro-cancers, and then we'll talk about uh, extent of operation and then the elective lymph node dissection. Uh, for most of you, this will be a review about the Kuma protocol. So in the Kuma hospital, uh, starting uh, 25 years ago, uh, Professor Miyauchi, who is uh, sitting right in front right here, uh, uh, you know, the, the Japanese are way ahead of us uh, uh, in many things, but especially in thyroid cancer. And uh, he noted that they were doing probably more operation than needed for these uh, seemingly fairly benign type cancers. So uh, he then decided to begin to offer observation for some of these patients who have uh, uh, very low risk micro cancers uh, that have no obvious lymph node metastasis, no uh, extensions and no nerve palsies and that does not appear to be high grade on cytology. And he would operate on them only if they grow by more than three millimeters or develop new lymph nodes and follow them yearly. And after many, many years, after I think that the uh, publication of this, the average following up time was about 15 years, only uh, uh, about 15 percent of the patient ended up with operation. No, none of the patient died from cancer, so this is more than 1,000 patients. There were no recurrences except for one patient who developed micro cancer in the contralateral lobe. This is a tremendous uh, finding. So I'm just going to go over in the next three or four slides the, the pertinent findings uh, in, in this study, which is a very, very important study. So over 10 years, they found that 8% of the patient had the nodule group by more than 3 millimeters. Over 10 years, it was about 4% of the patient that developed new lymph nodes uh, uh, on ultrasound. And together, about 7% of the patient over 10 years had developed clinical disease. And remember, 15% of these patients ended up uh, with operations. And more importantly, if you look at the data by age, and this is one of the more intriguing uh, findings, is that if you started out at age older than 60, essentially your tumor does not grow. You don't develop new lymph nodes, and the nodules don't grow at all. Now, I work also at the VA in, in addition to uh, the University of California. In my VA patients that have thyroid nodule, many of them are older than 60. 
And this is a very important information for me that when I find a micro cancer that appear to be low risk, I can actually very comfortably tell the patient that observation is a reasonable thing to do. Interestingly enough, if you start out at age younger than 40, you see that the curve is quite a bit different. They have a tendency to develop new lymph nodes, even though I've, I've told you that it's relatively safe to follow these patients. After 10 years, about 30% of them would have developed new lymph nodes by ultrasound. So if you're going to follow young patients with microcancer, you have to be prepared for the patient to know that they are prone to develop lymph nodes. As we know, it doesn't really change the stage in terms of mortality anyway. But still, in the younger patient that I uh, sometimes would ask to be followed, I tell the patient that you have a higher chance that you may end up needing an operation and you may end up having uh, lymph node metastasis that I've discovered during your follow-up. And so many times I tell them that it is very safe to follow, but keep in mind that your risk of ending up with an operation is higher than somebody who's 60 or older. And so uh, this is, uh, of course, Brian's here, so for me to go over these recommendations would be sort of silly, but uh, the, the ATA recommendation is that uh, in the U.S. at least, if the cytology result is diagnostic for cancer, surgery is generally recommended. But the next sentence is, however, active surveillance, so this is a Kuma protocol or the, 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 the Japanese uh, active surveillance, is considered as an alternative. But keep in mind that you need to make sure that there's no clinically evidence metastatic disease or local invasion and no convincing cytological evidence of aggressive disease. So you need to upfront be careful that to select your patient properly like they have done in the Kuma Hospital uh, to be able to get good results like this. Now, um, there's a recommendation about the smaller than one centimeter lesions that if you're going to operate on the patient, the initial surgical procedure should be a thyroid lobectomy. Now, the reason for this is this, that if it's actually okay to follow these patients, but you end up doing an operation, you should probably do the least amount of operation that the patient needs, which is a thyroid lobectomy. As you know, we no longer do partial thyroidectomy. Now, there are other studies uh, that's going on right now, and, and this is a recent study that I want to present to you, the Korean experience. And uh, so it, it, is the risk of active surveillance really this low? Can we replicate the Japanese uh, findings? And this is a Korean experience, which is quite short and in some way somewhat concerning. That this is a sh small study of 192 patients uh, with a median age of 51, and they follow up for a median of 2.5 years. So it's not as long as the Kuma protocol. And the tumors were quite small, 5.5 uh, millimeters. What they found is that they measured the tumor volume, and they found that uh, about 17% of these tumors actually shrunk in volume but about 14% of them actually increase in volume. So instead of just measuring by millimeter, they calculate the volume. Now, this is a very interesting. After median of 31-month follow-up, 24 of 192 patients had an operation. So this is about the same number of people that had an operation, but with less than three-year follow-up in contrast to the 10-year follow-up in Kuma Hospital. Interestingly enough, half of these operations were done because the patients got tired of being observed. So even though observation is a, act, active surveillance is an option, it, if the patients are not committed to do that, then it's a problem. Because you then end up essentially wasting time and money and you could have just gone ahead and done the operation in the first place. So if you're gonna be observing the patient, you better make sure up front that this is a patient who is committed to do this. But on the other hand, it's probably okay if the patient feel like they don't want an operation now, but they want an operation two years later, you may want to be more liberal about that. 
But the more concerning thing to me, however, is that there was some very concerning pathology that were found on the final uh, pathology. There were, there were two torsel cancers. 15 of these cancers were multifocal. You, you may say that's no, no big deal nowadays. And nine of them have extrathyroidal extension. And seven of the patients have some lymph nodes. And, and one can again argue about how important these issues are. But the bad cancers, the two tall cells out of 24 cancers does bother me. Because if you select out the patient, if you select the patient in the wrong way, uh, you can uh, end up uh, with results that you may, uh, you may regret. So we, we actually asked this question of how often do we find an unanticipated high risk uh, characteristic on the final pathology when your initial evaluation of a tumor appeared to be low risk. And uh, we did this study not on um, uh, microcarcinomas, but on cancers that are, that are between one to four centimeters. And the impetus for this study is that in the latest ATA guideline, it does not tell you that you have to do a lobectomy for low risk cancers, but it gives you an option that when it's between one centimeter and four centimeter, you can do a total thyroidectomy. But the recommendation is that it is okay to do a lobectomy. And we found that when we started following the recommendation, we were doing more completion total thyroidectomies than we like because our endocrinologists who either have read the guideline or maybe haven't read the guideline are maybe more aggressive than we are. In San Francisco, for some reason, our endocrinologists are more aggressive than the surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it is a role reversal. Operating, that's why. So if you, if you look at this, in apparently low-risk patients, that's one to four centimeters, we found 3% of these actually end up having aggressive histology. That we will all agree that we definitely don't really want to follow. We have patients that have vascular invasions, extrathyroidal extensions, positive margin, positive lymph nodes, ipsilateral multi and One can argue that some of these are not really high-risk features. You can march it back all the way down to 3%. So if you have endocrinologists who are willing to tolerate findings that I listed here, it is perfectly okay to do a lobectomy. But you should, ahead of time, work it out with your endocrinologist so that you know that under what circumstances they're going to want to have you take out the other side or want to give radioactive iodine so that you don't end up with uh, lots of uh, uh, second operation for completion thyroidectomy. And we actually um, uh, you know, try to do that. And in fact, I warn my patients. I say, it's OK if I take out your two centimeter lesion with a lobectomy, but be prepared. There's a small chance that we may find something in the final pathology that we have to go back and take out the other side. The patient's okay with that, it's perfectly okay to do that. But this is the caveat for the, the, the recent uh, change in recommendation that you can do a lobectomy uh, for low risk cancers. Now let's go uh, switch gear and talk about prophylactic uh, central neck node dissection. Um, uh, this is the data from one of the microcarcinoma studies uh, from WADA that's actually quoted quite frequently. And in this group of 259 patients, they had prophylactic lymph node dissections, meaning they did lymph node dissection when there was no clinical evidence of lymph node metastasis. 61% of the time, they find positive lymph nodes in the central neck. 40% of the time, they found lateral neck lymph node dissection. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the overall data, the recurrence rate, if they were done for for therapeutic reasons, meaning that there was clinical lymph nodes, so obviously you had to do that. The patient had about a 17% chance of recurrence. If they did a prophylactic lymph node dissection, the, the recurrence rate is 0.4%. So you say, oh, gee, that's really good. The surgeons did a good job. But at the same time, there was a group of patients who did not have prophylactic lymph node dissection and the lymph node recurrence rate was 0.6%, so it's essentially the same. 
So it basically tells you that these tiny, tiny lymph nodes that you find in people with even very, very small cancers don't mean very much. And I know there's obviously recent changes in the, in the staging and the guidelines for this. And uh, this is a, a, the paper that, was, that came out about five years ago that says we're never going to be able to tell uh, whether or not you, can, uh, you should or shouldn't do a prophylactic lymph node dissection in these low-risk patients because there's no way that we can randomize all these patients. And of course, the Italian took, it up, uh, took up the challenge immediately. And uh, this is uh, Paolo Micheli's data. It's a, it's a nice randomized study, but again, the problem is that it's a, a small number of patients. But this is a randomized study where 88 patients underwent total thyroidectomy and 93 patients had total thyroidectomy and prophylactic central neck node dissection with five-year follow-up. And the two differences they found was that in those without central neck dissection, 15 of them had radioactive iodine, and only three of the people that had total thyroidectomy and uh, lymph node dissection had radioactive iodine. If you look at the data, actually, it's probably because they were very aggressive in using radioactive iodine. So the difference is there is the perception of the endocrinologist of whether or not they should use radioactive iodine. And what they did find, which is statistically significant, is that if you do more central neck node dissection, you will have more hypoparathyroidism, which is very obvious very to bad. most of us that do these operations. Uh, it's not uncommon, especially doing a central neck nodes, to devascularize your uh, lower parathyroids. And th what they changed is that three patients were upstaged, but those actually, according to the new staging system, may not be upstaged anymore, and one patient had changed therapy. And I won't go through these two things because uh, the, that's already been talked about in terms of lymph nodes and risks. So in summary, uh, in terms of low-risk thyroid cancer in surgery, active surveillance is probably safe. We definitely need more uh, uh, prospective studies, and there's some warning from the, from the Korean study that we definitely need to do that. It's probably more appropriate for older patients because they appear to have less aggressive cancers. Lobectomy is sufficient for small papillary thyroid cancer, but how small is small? But you definitely have to be talking to your patients about the potential for reoperation if the final pathology turned out not to be as, as low risk as you think. And routine central neck lymph node dissection is not necessary, but maybe we want to have the added information, and that will be the reason to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pong. And finally, we have Dr. Doug Ross, and we are asking to cover post-operative adjuvant treatment with radioactive iodine, yes or no, a value of radioiodine ablation or treatment, and post-treatment surveillance strategies. Thanks very much, Dr. Shah. So in 12 minutes, radioactive iodine surveillance and cost effectiveness. <laughs> and we'll start with uh, radioactive iodine. Um, and these are the data of Mazafari that you're all familiar with, showing reduced death rates and reduced recurrence rates in people who get remnant ablation um, after radioactive iodine. But you'll notice that even Dr. Mazafari um, didn't show a benefit in stage one disease. Um, these are the data of Dr. Hay from the Mayo Clinic. These were low-risk patients with MESA scores less than six, and 20-year recurrence rates in node-negative patients were unchanged by giving radioactive iodine. They were unchanged in node-positive patients. 20-year mortality um, was negative um, with or without radioactive iodine. And again, in node-positive patients, there was no difference whether or not they got radioactive iodine. And these data um, from France using the current um, low-risk classification show no change in 10-year overall survival or disease-free survival um, in patients who were or who were not given radioactive iodine. These are the financial um, implications of giving radioactive iodine using the SEER database from 2004 to 2012, 38,000 plus patients. Um, 45.5% of stage one patients received radioactive iodine with no survival advantage. This cost was $9.1 million a year or $82.3 million um, for the course um, of the study. 
Radioactive iodine, in addition, as you know, beats up salivary glands and has been associated in several studies with about a 19 percent increased risk um, of secondary malignancies. So Dr. Shah asked me for the indications for radioactive iodine um, in low-risk patients. So I consulted the ATA guidelines, and it says that radioactive iodine remnant ablation is not routinely recommended after radioactive iodine in low-risk patients. So I started reading through the guidelines, trying to find out, well, when would you use it? Um, and I came across this, that if remnant ablation is performed for a low-risk patient, 30 millicuries um, is the dose that you should get, but I still couldn't really find any indications for when you might use it. So not deterred, I made up some indications um, that I tend to use. Um, so the first aggressive histology is actually mentioned in the guidelines and was just um, talked about. If you have a microcarcinoma with aggressive histology, it's suggested that you might want to give um, radioactive iodine. However, have any of you ever seen a tall cell that takes up radioactive iodine? I think we're just treating ourselves and not the patient or the tumor um, with that recommendation. But in the next few slides, I want to talk about the skill of the surgeon, microscopic positive surgical margins, which are not part of any of the staging systems, multifocality, and a high um, postoperative thyroglobulin level. So starting with the skill of a surgeon, this is a postoperative I-123 scan um, after um, a patient has had a total thyroidectomy by one of our high volume academic surgeons. Here's another one. There's a little bit of a remnant on this um, scan, um, probably guarding a parathyroid or perhaps the nerve. But this is a total thyroidectomy um, from a surgeon in the community. And here's another total thyroidectomy from a surgeon in the community. And one wonders um, whether that type of patient um, might actually have some um, incremental benefit um, from giving radioactive iodine. What about microscopic positive margins? I came across this paper, 100 patients with positive margins um, with a mean follow-up of 130 months. Um, if you had an anterior margin, oops, um, an anterior margin, um, there was no benefit um, there was no increased um, uh, risk for recurrence, but if you had a posterior margin, um, there's a significant increased risk for recurrence. These are small numbers, only five of 43 patients, um, but nonetheless, um, having a positive microscopic margin that was posterior um, might be a reason why you might consider um, giving radioactive iodine. For multifocal disease, remnant ablation seems logical, um, if there was disease throughout the gland and you have remnants left, there might be disease there as well. But most of the patients that we talk about that have multifocal disease just have additional foci of tumor that are just a few millimeters in size. And you just saw the data that show that only 8% of those grow um, over a 10-year period. Um, in the National Thyroid Cancer Tumor, Cancer Tumor Cooperative um, registry, um, we um, looked at the use of radioactive iodine in multifocal um, papillary microcarcinomas and did not show um, any benefit at all. Um, however, um, the stage and risk assessment, as you know, is based on the largest lesion in multifocal disease. And I think we really need some sort of method for de defining multifocal disease similar to the one that we're now using for um, central nodes. Certainly there's a difference um, in someone who has um, a 14, a 12, an 11, and a 12 um, millimeter um, tumor than someone who um, just has a bunch of microcarcinomas. Um, and um, I've been adding up tumor diameters for a long time. People laugh at me when I do that. Um, but Dr. Tam has now joined um, me with this paper, um, which looked at the ratio of the biggest tumor diameter to the total tumor diameter. You have to think a second about that. So a low ratio means that the other tumors were larger. Um, and it showed that low ratios were associated with an increased risk of nodal METs. Um, and perhaps that type of multifocality um, deserves um, radioactive iodine ablation. 
And finally, um, a lot of us are looking at the postoperative thyroglobulin. I think the guidelines are correct when they said that the optimum cutoff value for postoperative serum thyroglobulin to guide decision making regarding radioactive iodine administration is simply not known. Um, this is because the studies are just all over the place. Um, you really need to correlate that thyroglobulin with ultrasound, surgical skills, and the assay that you're using. Um, for example, if there's a perfectly benign large thyroid remnant, the thyroglobulin, of course, is going to be high, um, but that doesn't necessarily um, indicate that that patient needs um, radioactive iodine. One of the major arguments for doing remnant ablation is the value of the post-treatment thyroglobulin. Um, I'd like to spend a moment, however, on what the value is of a post-treatment um, scan, um, since this study um, was a little bit concerning. Um, it looks at scans, thyroglobulin, and ultrasound. Here's the thyroglobulin um, increasing. Um, this is the N and the percent of patients who would be called low risk by the ATA. Um, clearly, um, ultrasounds could identify um, lymph nodes. There were 20 um, lymph nodes that were identified in these patients, and the chance of having a lymph node increased as your thyroglobulin um, went up. But there were seven patients where the I-131 scan only um, suggested that there was a problem. Um, and of these seven, four of them were low-risk patients. 1.5% of these low-risk patients had disease found on I-131 scan, and this included two patients with lung mets um, and one patient um, with a bone met. So these authors said it's questionable whether the administration of remnant ablation to all patients to locate only a small but not negligible group of metastatic patients is really justified. We don't know what the impact of this delay is upon their survival. Um, this is not an isolated finding. Um, in this study of 202 low-risk patients that were followed for eight years, same percentage, 1.5 percent, three of the patients um, had structural disease in the lung that was subsequently um, identified. So moving on to surveillance after initial therapy, there are innumerable publications, and I'm just going to go through one. Um, this is Rosario's paper, 578 patients with 66-month follow-up. There were 12 structural recurrences. So thyroglobulin um, greater than 0.2 um, identified 10 of the 12. Ultrasound identified 9 of the 10 that had cervical nodes. But there were two patients with pulmonary metastases, and one of these was a stage um, one patient. What about following um, nodules um, in the thyroid bed on ultrasound? In this study, 17 of 191 nodules um, uh, grew. The average growth rate was 1.3 millimeters per year. This is um, a slide that looks at the um, change in thyroid um, lymph nodes. The average um, lymph node was 13 millimeters with a 3.5 um, follow-up, 3.5 year follow-up. About 20 percent of them grew by 3 millimeters, a little under 10 percent by 5 millimeters. Um, most of them were stable. So what about cost effectiveness? There's this modeled study. They compared annual surveillance to annual surveillance for the first five years, then every three years. Um, there was 38-year follow-up in this model, and the incremental cost of annual screening was $260,000 per quality-adjusted life year. It would um, be um, what they considered reasonable if the cost of ultrasound were under $23. So here's some real data from Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and I apologize that it's hard to read these numbers here, um, but this looked at um, low-risk, intermediate, and high-risk. There were three recurrences out of about 362 patients in the low-risk group, um, and what they found was that it cost $148,000 to pick up each of those recurrences in the low-risk group, um, as opposed to $22,000 and $20,000 in the intermediate and high-risk group, um, respectively. This looks at um, the um, what happens with all of this um, imaging that we're doing. So this is a slide that you've short, sort of seen a couple times. This red line is the increased um, incidence of um, papillary thyroid cancer. 
um, but it's not as steep as you'd expect because I had to put this on the graph, and this is the increased use of ultrasound for following these patients with thyroid cancer. And this shows that this increased risk of ultrasonography is associated with a 2.3-fold increased risk of surgery, um, but there was no change in disease-specific um, survival. On the other hand, the use of iodine scans was associated with a reduction um, in disease-specific survival. And finally, my last slide is just to talk about one um, other important part of following these patients, and that's suppressive therapy, although for patients who have um, an excellent response, um, the guidelines tell us that we should back off um, and that we should be aiming for low normal TSHs in order to prevent um, the side effects of suppressive therapy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you all. I think in my judgment, all four of you gave a very objective, uh, critical, neutral, unbiased, and contemporary assessment of the low-risk thyroid cancer patient. For that, I really want to applaud you. <laughs> However, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to present some cases to the panelists where even the low-risk patients, clinicians get puzzled. So here is a 50-year-old electrician. He was found to have an asymptomatic thyroid mass during a routine physical exam by his GP. An ultrasound was done, which showed a three centimeter intrathyroidal mass in the right lobe with a mixed echo structure. Left lobe was unremarkable on sonogram, and there were no enlarged lymph nodes on the neck ultrasound. Finally, respiration showed follicular cells Bethesda category three, and this is how the patient presented. Quan? Um, I think um, this, so this patient, uh, I will be basically talking to the patient about, uh, what, is it he or she? Electrician, I guess, could be either. Um, but anyway, um, I would say the options are, upfront operation, uh, repeat needle biopsy for uh, uh, genetic marker studies for uh, GEC or for uh, thyroxine. Um, I think just um, uh, upfront observation is probably difficult to do in these patients because no, Oslo, I'm an electrician. You tell me what I should do. Okay. <laughs> Um, you are the elect okay. Yes. Some electricians are PhDs. No, no, no. <laughs> I just connect two wires. Yeah. They tell me whatever you tell me, I'll do. Okay, so it'll be like a VA patient. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, so I would I would tell this patient that, and I would try to look at the ultrasound myself. Okay. Because I think that can give you some more clue. Right. And and find out from the patient, you know, how important voice and various other things are, how important the I star. don't care, doctor, what to do. <laughs> yeah, your voice is already bad, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, in general, in my practice, these patients end up with a, a repeat needle biopsy for a gene expression classifier. Okay. A three centimeter for OSFLOS in our center, that actually is a good way to do it because uh, OSFLOS for us is about 10 to 15% chance of cancer. If the GEC comes back low risk, that's about less than 5% risk cancer, and the patient feels comfortable with it, whatever I tell him to do, then I would just follow this. If it's okay. suspicious, the increase is up to about 40, 50 percent. Well, what's the probability accomplish. that this 50-year-old man with a three-centimeter nodule is going to come to surgery? Say that again? What is the probability that this 50-plus-year-old man with a three-centimeter solitary thyroid mass is eventually going to come to surgery? Low, high probability? Um, I haven't followed many of these patients for a long time, but I don't think it's that high. Okay, so the patient flies across the country, comes to Luis. Yeah. <laughs> and she to can operate on them. Yeah, <laughs> to your VA. <laughs> to your VA, yeah. Uh, you know, I would do the same thing as Kwan do, but I can, I can tell that you would like me to operate. <laughs> no, I, well, because if you don't, he's gonna go somewhere else. That's right, so I say, okay, so he did go somewhere else because the panelists didn't want to operate. And he had a lobectomy. 
uh, final pathology showed a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, low grade, no extra thyroid extension, margins clear. Brian, what stage would this be? So I'm trying to look at the thing. First of all, I like the tattoo on that patient. That was very helpful. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to look at the size, because this that's the bifurcated, right, with the size. So this is uh, what what size tumor? Uh, this two is centimeter, say, two and a half centimeter? Three, three about, centimeter? About three centimeters. About three centimeter. OK, so follicular variant. Uh, no extra thyroidal extension, margins clear. I guess no lymph nodes were removed Correct. from this lobectomy. Um, you know, so this, and the patient is how old? 50. 50. So this would be a stage two patient in the seventh edition of ADCC. No, no, we are in 2017. <laughs> eighth edition isn't coming till January 2018. Implementation. <laughs> eighth, eighth edition is already published. Anyway. So this so would be a stage one in the eighth edition. Moving forward, this would be still a stage one patient. In the eighth edition. Correct. OK. Uh, risk group? Uh, from what we can see here, this is a low risk patient. OK. Doug? So this is a low risk patient. So I certainly uh, would just observe with ultrasound and thyroglobulins. And I wouldn't uh, give radioactive iodine um, unless the um, post-operative thyroglobulin was but he had, he high. only had a lobectomy. Oh, well, well, still, I would still probably check that thyroglobulin to make sure it wasn't 500. But okay. as long as it was consistent so, with a with so a lobe, I'm um, glad you I mentioned that. Radioactive so iron. tell us the value of thyroglobulin in patients who undergo lobectomy. So um, they certainly are much less useful than a patient who's had a total thyroidectomy. Is it useless? Um, it's not useless if you see a thyroglobulin that is rising. Um, you have to take into account the TSH that was measured at the time the thyroglobulin was measured. Um, but if you see a thyroglobulin that's unexpectedly rising, you should investigate further. So you're t what you're telling me is that, that the thyroglobulin trending is of value in a post-lobectomy patient. Yes. Not a single value, but right. trending. Okay. Fair enough. OK. So we talked about stage and risk group. Any further treatment, Kwan? He flies back to uh, California after lobectomy on the East Coast. So the same patient that did not want to follow my advice <laughs> and, uh, went to get an operation and come back to me. Right. In general, I don't take out the other low for this patient. But this will be the same patient that will go find somebody else to come take out to the me. other side. Right. Yeah, we'll Greg <laughs> agrees. <laughs> OK, so we are, <coughs> Doug already spoke about <coughs> surveillance strategies, so I think you know, we'll skip that. Here is another, I, I want to take through various scenarios, so we'll be going rather quickly. But these are typical issues which we face day to day. 28-year-old female college student found to have a, about a centimeter, 9.5 millimeters, uh, <coughs> Michael, a thyroid nodule in the right lobe during routine physical exam. Ultrasound shows bilateral thyroid nodules each measuring less than a centimeter, and finally respiration of one nodule shows papillary carcinoma. She undergoes total thyroidectomy. Pathology report shows one centimeter classical papillary carcinoma without extra thyroid extension, and one three millimeter lymph node with metastatic papillary carcinoma. Uh, her postoperative TGB is less than 0.1 with no antibodies. Brian and Doug, adjuvant treatment and surveillance strategy. Um, I would thank the surgeon um, and the, that she's doing well after surgery. Um, and with this thyroglobulin and the antibodies being negative, I, I think we've got a good cure in this patient. I would not offer this patient adjuvant therapy for that three millimeter lymph node. And the patient can be watched with serum thyroglobulin and ultrasound. Doug, do you agree, agree with that? Um, I agree. I mean, this patient is sort of in the wrong panel because they're intermediate risk by the ATA definition um, since she has a three millimeter <laughs> um, central node. But I, I think that um, it's um, intermediate risk is consider therapy. And um, you would uh, consider this and not treat with radioactive iodine um, because the thyroglobulin is so low. And this is such minimal So you disease. would not, both of you would agree that you would not push the surgeon to go back to do a central node dissection. Oh, definitely not. Well, there you go. That'd be good. <laughs> so as we know, um, 
if you, if you look for central nodes, you're going to find them. Um, um, you saw Wada's data um, that that demonstrates that 60% of these patients have central nodes. Um, if you take them out, they have a good prognosis. If you don't take them out, um, they also have a good prognosis. And the difference between recurrence rates is at much is at most one to two percent a year. And you very vividly showed that the benefit of radioiodine in this setting in a 28-year-old is more harm than help. Exactly. Fair well, enough. OK. Uh, here is another one uh, pertaining to adjuvant therapy. 40-year-old housewife has a nodular goiter for many years uh, and with several sub-centimeter bilateral nodules, some with mixed echostructure. Her endocrinologist decides to do a needle biopsy of one nodule from each side. And both needle biopsies show papillary carcinoma in both lobes, two separate nodules. She undergoes total thyroidectomy. Pathology report shows multifocal papillary carcinomas, all intrathyroidal, all sub-centimeter, uh, measuring one centimeter, six millimeters, three millimeters, and two foci of one millimeter each. What should be the course of action now? Doug, patient sent to you. So, so here's where I start adding up the diameters of these uh, tumors um, and come up with a, a total volume that's, that's um, just above um, um, 20 millimeters. Um, so the total volume of tumor that this patient has um, is not particularly great. Um, she um, is a low-risk patient, um, and unless the thyroglobulin is unexpectedly high, this is a patient that I would follow without radioactive iodine. Brian, would you agree with that? Yes. I would, the only thing I would add is that, remember, these patients some, a lot of times don't come just de novo saying, what do you want me to do? A number of them have talked to other people, looked on the Internet, and so they, they're going to have their own opinions as well. So you want to talk to them about the different options and the risks and benefits. But this is, again, someone I would not be pushing. If their thyroglobulin is low and the antibody is negative, I would not be pushing for radioiodine. So the point where I try to drive home is multifocality within the thyroid capsule of low volume tumors is not an indication for adjuvant treatment. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think we talk about uh, the endocrinologist needing to find a good surgeon, and I think maybe the surgeons need to find a Zen good endocrinologist. endocrinologist. Who thinks or Zen is one, one that isn't going to send people back for lots more <laughs> surgery. <laughs> All right, let's get to another one. This is our dilemma. 48 year old banker presents with stage two squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue with N0 neck. He undergoes partial glossectomy and elective modified neck dissection. Pathology report shows 36 lymph nodes in this specimen, all of them negative for metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, but one one centimeter lymph node with a three millimeter focus of metastatic papillary carcinoma without extra nodal extension. <laughs> Clearly, he undergoes postoperative workup, including ultrasound of the thyroid and Neck, which is completely negative, what should we do? Juan? So uh, just like previous patient, this patient probably will end up with a total thyroidectomy by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> I would talk to the patient okay. about the fact that there's all of the lymph nodes that were taken out, but although I don't know how extensive coming down to how level there is. It was level one to four dissection. One to four. So yep. we still have five and still have six. And so you say, well, there's only one lymph node that's positive, And we know that even though this is three millimeter rather than two, so you worry a little bit that the, the, the risk is probably low. But uh, this patient has a lymph node that's positive, And you worry about somebody like this uh, that you will have to do something more with, especially with the tongue cancer and all of those things. It's an easy operation to take out the thyroid and the central nodes. And I know this is what he's going to end up having. So I'll talk to the patient about it. I don't think it's, you'd have to do it in a hurry. The problem is that without taking it out, you're not going to be able to find the distant metastases that you talked about. And there's a small risk that he may have that. So distant metastases without a demonstrable primary and a three millimeter metastatic focus. Luis, you want to make a comment <laughs> so, on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Maybe somebody's probably going to end up taking out his thyroid. But I think if you can keep a good relationship with him, 
we need to first get him through his tongue cancer, right, and make sure that he doesn't die of that first. His risk of dying is much higher from that first. And so engaging in that discussion and say, you know what, we can watch this for quite a while safely with an ultrasound and just see what happens. Let's make sure you get through the first couple of years. And then we can maybe talk about whether you want your thyroid out, if it changes, if it doesn't change. I mean, if you can have that dialogue, maybe you can keep it from flying out to California or out to Vermont. Good. Any? So, so I also think it's safe to watch this, um, but there are a couple comments that I would make. Um, you didn't say where exactly the positive node was. If number was three. Like, number three. So, um, yeah, so that, that suggests some um, um, thyroid and there's nothing on the ultrasound. Um, so I don't think I would pursue that. If it had been higher up in the neck, I would worry about um, perhaps a malignancy along the thyroglossal duct tract, but assume, presumably he's had MRIs or CTs of his um, neck and that has been excluded. Um, and presumably he's also had a look at his lungs um, because of his squamous cell carcinoma. And so if there's no evidence for um, metastatic disease anywhere, I think it would be safe to just observe so this So how patient. many in the audience will do a thyroidectomy on this patient? If you would raise your hands. We got, we got a few. <laughs> How many of you are 20, surgeons? 30. <laughs> so, so, Brian, these guys want to do thyroidectomy. Well, endocrinologists are the most aggressive surgeons. Yeah, but, <laughs> but these are surgeons. They're, they're surgeons, too, huh? There you go. Well, but I think Quan said at the beginning, this patient, if they want, somebody would do a thyroidectomy for them. So the, the, the point we're trying to drive home is incidentally found metastatic cancer for a more aggressive, life-threatening malignancy treatment in the absence of a demonstrable primary, which occurs quite often in the thyroid gland or other nodes, is perfectly safe to watch. There is no compelling reason to go and do a total thyroidectomy uh, and a completion neck dissection in that setting. Okay, let's take one more. Uh, this we saw, okay. Because a 19-year-old female college student undergoes, uh, was diagnosed to have a thyroglossal duct cyst measuring about three centimeters in diameter. She undergoes a classical cyst trunk operation. Final pathology report shows a eight millimeter intracystic papillary carcinoma arising from the cyst wall without extra cystic extension. Post-operative ultrasound of the thyroid and neck is completely negative. What should we do? Doug, you talked about thyroglossal tract. So here is a thyroglossal tract, incidentally found intracystic papillary carcinoma. We all see this occasionally. So this is a microcarcinoma, and if it doesn't have any features that are concerning for recurrence, such as um, positive surgical margins, um, this is a patient that doesn't need radioactive iodine. So if they don't need radioactive iodine, they don't need to have their thyroid taken out. So you would simply follow the patient? Yes. Does all of you agree? Louise, go on. Well, I just want to also You're going to find somebody to do that. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I, mean I would, again, not, to op not want to operate on this patient, but I will warn this patient. Microcarcinoma in a young patient has high risk of nodal metastasis. Correct. Now, even though the, the data from Kuma Hospital showed those to be new metastases, they will probably be growth from previously existing lymph nodes. But you, so don't, you won't recommend that. elective bilateral node no, dissections? Of course not. Okay. But, but she is at very high risk during long-term follow-up to have... Well, very high problem. meaning, what, can you quantify very high? Well, if you look A low-risk papillary carcinoma. Okay, so if you look at the Kuma Hospital's data, 30% after 10 years of follow-up, uh, no, sorry, 7%. Right. 7% after 10 years of follow-up will show new, show new lymph nodes, yeah. even if half of those were really new and the other yeah. half But that won't be called very high risk. Well, it's 7% over, tw over 20 years? Well, but the patient needs to know that. Of course. Yeah. But I, I think the other caution here, though, is this is in it in a cyst, in a thyroglossal duct cyst, that's data from obviously primary thyroid. And we, I don't, at least from what I've read, I don't think we have good evidence on sort of what the potential metastases to lymph nodes would be in this specific patient versus a patient who has a primary thyroid tumor. 
may not uh, be as high. I certainly agree this patient needs to be followed. Um, you probably aren't going to use ultrasound as your primary modality. Um, you probably want to do MRIs of the neck to look for those um, um, nodal metastases that, that may be higher up in the neck and not in an area that's accessible to ultrasound. Right and I would use an MRI because she's 19 and you don't want to get CT scans for a long period of time. All right. <clears throat> Let's take another scenario. Uh, Kwan, this for you. 42-year-old socialite attends a check-your-neck session. Uh, Only happened in New York. <laughs> check-your-neck session, uh, Michael, uh, uh, organized by the Light of Life Foundation at her country club. She volunteers to have a free ultrasound of the thyroid, and the right lobe shows an 8-millimeter nodule with microcalcifications, and the le left lobe is a 3-millimeter cyst, and a 2.5 millimeter nodule with mixed acrostructure. Eventually, she winds up with a fine little aspiration biopsy of the 8 millimeter nodule, which shows papillary carcinoma. What are her options? And if she chooses to have surgery, what would be the extent of surgery? Question both for Luis and Juan. So, I mean, I think her options are she looks like she's a reasonable candidate for surveillance. She could also choose to have a, um, they did the right nodule. She could also talk about lobectomy. Oh, sorry. You could also talk about lobectomy. So, I think that's kind of the discussion so that we would have. So, your options for her are either Obs observation or a lobectomy. Yeah. Kwan? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think in, uh, in a, 42-year-old like this, uh, the thing that I would tell her is that even though the uh, active surveillance is a reasonable thing to do, uh, she is at the high, at a higher risk after 10 years to be operated on if she was 62. Uh, but by the time she's 52, she gets an operation, it's probably okay. Um, again, whether or not the other side having very small nodule, I think that's part of the question that you're asking, does that contribute to our thinking? I don't think a three millimeter, three millimeter lesion on the other side really would change what I think about this. Now, but that's exactly the reason why I put this in, because some people would think that there is a nodule on the other side that may grow. We don't know the histology. Why not total thyroidectomy? Right. Yeah. So that's the reason I yes. deliberately put it in. Yeah. So I, I would, I would tell her that observation is an option. Uh, active surveillance, but she needs to be want to do that, and also I need to make sure that the, with the location and all that, that this is in fact a low risk lesion. If she wants an operation, I think a lobectomy is a reasonable thing to do for somebody like this, despite the small nodules on the other side. Doug, your surgeons in Boston would agree with this? Um, so I just want to bring up another issue, which is why an eight millimeter nodule was biopsied in the first place. Or why um, she went to well, a th this screening. Is, this, this, was, screening. You know, this is the downward dwindle. Right. She volunteered to have an ultrasound, and she asked for it. So, um, but. But the guidelines say that we don't biopsy um, subcentimetric nodules um, unless they have particular c concerning features, such as nodules that have invaded the capsule of the thyroid or, or might be invading the recurrent laryngeal nerve or trachea. So this is a nodule that shouldn't have been biopsied in the first place. Um, it depends really who was pushing for that biopsy. If she was, she's going to want surgery, so observation um, is probably a moot point. Brian, how about in Denver? I agree with Doug. I mean, yeah, I don't have much to add to that. It's, it's, it's got a lot going to be what was driving this um, in the patient, and obviously, again, coming back to the surgeon, the patient and the endocrinologist or whoever they're referring them back to it, you have to look at that anxiety level as well. But. Uh, Medically, I think this monitoring this patient would not, that would be fine as long as there are no abnormal features on ultrasound that would make you more worried. See, going through these cases, you appreciate that most of the time that you will be spending with low risk patients is in not in treating them, but in educating them about their disease and having them understand to follow the disease along with you. I think, you know, you spend more time in the consulting room in a low risk patient to either go for surveillance or a lobectomy than doing a lobectomy by itself, which takes 45 minutes. <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the, the take-home point is that you need to get your point, patient to understand the disease and follow the disease along with you. 
Here is another one. During the course of a total thyroidectomy in a patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and a 1.5 centimeter papillary carcinoma in the left lobe, the surgeon finds a 4 millimeter lymph node in this ipsilateral tracheoesophageal groove. He sends it for frozen section, which confirms metastatic papillary carcinoma. He completes ipsilateral central compartment dissection. And final pathology re report shows additional 2 and 3 millimeter metastatic lymph nodes. So we have three nodes now, uh, 2 millimeter, 3 millimeter, and 4 millimeter. Post-op thyroglobulin is 1.5, uh, antibodies 60, and uh, peroxidase antibodies 88. What should we do now, Brian? Well, I wouldn't go with the first, the reoperation for a central node dissection on this patient. You would or you would not? Would not. Would not. I would okay, not so the, listen, this is an endocrinologist telling you not I'm, to reoperate. I'm Zen. I'm a Zen endocrinologist. Um, and th this is one where you could talk to the patient about. Uh, now you'd be thinking about remnant ablation, not adjuvant therapy necessarily in this patient for decreasing recurrence risk for the radioiodine. Um, again, I'm comfortable following though a patient with positive antibodies after a thyroidectomy. If the antibody titer is rising, you could consider something, you know, as far as testing or intervention with radioiodine. Um, but I don't feel strongly, again, that I would not, if I used it, I would use it as remnant ablation, not as adjuvant therapy. Okay. Doug? So these patients with Hashimoto's and papillary cancer are always difficult to follow, especially with ultrasound. Um, they frequently have nodes next to their thyroid that are benign nodes that are going to cause anxiety on, on subsequent imaging, um, and their thyroglobulins frequently can't be measured accurately because um, of interfering antibodies. Um, so this is a patient that I would have a discussion with as to whether they were more motivated towards a 30 millicure dose of radioactive iodine or chest observation. I think either of those would be reasonable alternatives, um, but ablating remnants might make it easier to follow um, her subsequently and might um, result in reductions in anxiety from ultrasound findings subsequently. All right, so I think we are in agreement there. So, see, here, here is a probably one of the last cases, 35-year-old social worker on the endocrine services at Mass General Hospital, uh, <laughs> Doug, yeah. uh, Greg. Uh, she decides to have an ultrasound of her thyroid, and lo and behold, a seven millimeter solid nodule with mixed echo structure is found in the right thyroid lobe. She insists on having a little biopsy. Mind you, she's a social worker, so you can't argue with them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the FNS is, is inconclusive, Bethesda category three. So the question I have is, should she have genomic testing, number one? Uh, because there is a, you may give her an option to observe. If you are going to observe, why bother about proving a diagnosis? So that's the reason I am putting this specifically, seven millimeter nodule, sonographically suspicious, cytologically negative, should we do genomic testing? If so, why? And if you are going to do it, again, I, I don't want to go, but should it be FMR thyrosic or any other additional molecular uh, studies, a la uh, Jim Fagin? And what's the recommendation of each of you independently? I'll start with Brian. This is the last case. Well, I guess the other thing I would do, as we said, is I'd make sure there are obviously no abnormal lymph nodes. If, nodes if, are negative. If, if that, so this is, if the only thing is a seven millimeter nodule. We're done. So no genomic testing? No. Okay. Louise? Well, one of the interesting things that the um, surveillance protocol tries to make clear is that you can actually also monitor things that aren't clearly cancer. So you could certainly monitor with ultrasound, and if it changes, then do your needle biopsy. So that might be an okay. option. Doug? So my recommendation would have been to monitor this nodule to begin with, but she insisted upon a biopsy. So if she insisted upon a biopsy, I don't think that molecular testing is going to be sufficiently reassuring for her, and I suspect that she's going to end up having surgery. Um, but my recommendation would be to do nothing. Okay. Go on. Well, I had exactly this patient. Oh. <laughs> who they insisted on getting a thyroseek. 
Okay. And had an NRAS positive lesion. Okay. And then she insisted that NRAS is really, really bad. <laughs> so okay. she insisted to have her thyroid out. Okay. The whole thing? The whole thing. <laughs> and of course, there was no cancer. What would be your recommendation? Let's forget her. No, my recommendation would be to leave it alone and follow it. All right. So I think, you know, in the last 20 seconds, I'll conclude. What we have learned in the last 90 minutes is that low risk papillary carcinoma is not a fatal disease. There is a finite, below 10% risk of recurrence uh, in the nodes or in the primary site. The benefit of adjuvant therapy is shown in only limited number of highly selected patients. Doug, correct me if I am misquoting you. Uh, and we need to have the patient understand the disease and spend more time with the patient on your first visit, such that the patient doesn't wind up getting over-aggressive treatment and pay for its sequela and ra raise the cost of treatment. Thank you.